Hello and welcome to the eco-webinar, Public Access and Libraries, Realizing the Potential, Avoiding the Pitfalls. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Valencia Rysvenikova. I'm a Policy and Research Officer at IFA Headquarters, and I'll be the moderator of this session today. We will give one more minute for everyone to join in, and in the meantime, can briefly go over how this session will be organized. Please note that this webinar is recorded. The recording will be made available on IFLAS channels for viewers who could not join us today. For this webinar, viewer microphones have been muted, but we very much encourage you to stay engaged and share your thoughts and questions in the Q&A and the chat box. Joining us today are three speakers. The first speaker is Professor Louise Cook, who led the initiative to prepare the IFLA guidelines on public internet access in libraries. In a few moments, Louise will kick off the discussion about the value of public internet access in libraries today. She will also take a more in-depth look at the guidelines on public access. Then you'll hear from our second speaker, John Dolan, OBE. John is a libraries and regeneration consultant based in Birmingham, UK. John will offer us more insights on public access drawing on the experiences of libraries in several lower income countries and in the UK. We'll then hear from Kirsty Crawford. Kirsty is a program director of the Libraries Unlimited British Council program in Bangladesh. She will discuss the experiences and lessons learned from the Libraries Unlimited program. After their presentations, we'll kick off the panel discussion and Q&A. Once again, many thanks for joining us today, and we look forward to hearing from you. When sharing your comments and questions, you are always welcome to indicate if you're directing your question to one of our panelists in particular. And with this, I would like to give the floor to Professor Louise Cook. Louise is an Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Lead at the School of Business and Economics of Longborough University in the UK. Thank you so much for joining us, Louise. So to start the discussion, you have led the preparation of the IFLA Public Internet Access Guidelines, and now it has been one year since the guidelines were published. What were some of the key insights? What are some of the lessons learned in this year? Thank, thank you very much, Valencia, and uh, just to say hello to everyone who has joined us and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd also just like to thank Valencia for all the work she's put into organising this and to John and Kirsty for um, agreeing to join. Um, so I'd like to um, start off with a little bit about um, why public internet access in libraries is, is so important. If we see internet access as actually a fundamental human right that enables people to play a role in democracy and society, um, access to quality information, and by that I mean you know, information that is accurate, that is um, authentic, that is objective, true, and so on, is absolutely key in enabling that democratic function. And we know that without sort of uh, genuine digital inclusion, sections of, uh, of society are going to be at serious risk of social exclusion because they don't have, they, are, they can be excluded from certain vital services, economic opportunities, access to education, creative and cultural expression, and so on. But it is wrong to believe that the digital divide is something from the past and you know and I've sort of heard many people say you know that uh, oh everybody has a smartphone these days and this is not actually true there is still a, around um, a third of the world's population who, that are not connected and even where people do have connections often um, it may be slow unreliable um, it may be via a uh, a small mobile device which isn't suitable for complex transactions and in addition we know also that there's still a skills divide um, and also a motivation sometimes and confidence divide especially where content is not seen as being relevant or lacks translation so being able to um, access the information in libraries is absolutely critical Access to information also plays a role in supporting the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals in reducing poverty and inequality, countering misinformation, fostering access to better health, well-being, economic uh, opportunities and so on. And libraries and librarians have long been seen as trusted intermediaries between people and the information they need to live their lives. 
They're able to help individuals navigate the complex digital landscape and develop the skills required to use the internet in a safe and confident um, manner. And they can help also to counter misinformation and fake news. And we've seen how important this is in the era of COVID-19. Um, it can quite literally be a matter between life and death. But it's not just um, a question of civil rights and, and democratic rights, it's also um, an economic necessity, um, both for the individual, but also for national governments um, who you know, are, want to roll out online government services, things like in the UK, the digital by default agenda and the rollout of universal credit um, will not be possible if portions or sections of society don't have proper access to the uh, internet and the ability to have that skills support. Individuals denied access to the internet are barred from opportunities for economic betterment and that can lead to a sort of vicious spiral of um, deprivation. At na national level, public internet access can strengthen national and local economies by enhancing the ability to harness the economic value of information access and exchange, learning, digital creativity and so on. And it's, it's been recognised as a crucial part of the development equation in the IFLA Leon Declaration of 2014. It can also be of significant value in cases of emergency disaster um, relief and recovery um, as has been seen, for example, in the US. Um, and again, in the era of COVID, the role of pub public libraries in combating misinformation on the internet and providing access to the economic benefits on the internet becomes critical. Okay. So I'd like to, first of all, just give you a little bit of background to the guidelines and how they came ab about. Um, and then I will move on to talking about the um, sort of key principles and messages. It will of necessity be a very high level overview because we want to allow lots of time for discussion this morning. But um, first of all, um, they, the guidelines came about as a result of a project called MAPLE, which stood for Managing Access to the Internet in Public Libraries. Um, which I led on in the UK, funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. And this project was born out of um, a passion that I have in terms of um, wanting to see widest possible access to information, freedom of expression, and so on. And a kind of hunch that actually in the provision in libraries, at least in the UK, was, you know, very far from being um, fully open. So the findings from the MAPLE project led to the recommendations that formed the basis of the um, initial sort of draft of the guidelines and they were intended to help um, practitioners in this very difficult balancing act between the sort of professional ethos of um, freedom of expression and, and you know, a, a, hostility to censorship, um, but also at the same time having to meet the needs of their um, sort of parent bodies, their local communities, legal obligations and so on. And this has led to a very difficult balance for most practitioners. Once we had a draft of the guidelines, they were went to a very wide international consultation and I would here offer my thanks to everyone who participated in that consultation, which led to a, quite a lot of significant revision and improvements, because we were very mindful that we wanted the guidelines to be genuinely applicable worldwide, rather than, you know, something just developed for one specific local context. And as Valencia said, they were launched a year ago at Athens at the World Library and Information Congress there. So a bit about um, the key principles 
and messages um, in the guidelines. As I say, this will necessarily be a very high level overview. You can access the full guidelines on the um, IFLA website um, if, if you would like to um, see greater depth of details. But the key message, first of all, is that they were drafted as a set of principles for guidance rather than hard and fast rules. Um, because it, it is recognised that the impact of local context is so critical in this, with this sort of issue. So they, they should hopefully enable policymakers and practitioners to arrive at decisions that work in their own local context, but give some guiding principles. And the first and most important of that is that um, internet access should be as open as possible within the boundaries of legality, safeguarding and community norms. So librarians shouldn't be putting on unnecessary restrictions, even though we recognise that there will inevitably be some constraints. We also recommend that every library um, or information service that um, offers uh, public internet access should have an internet use policy that is clear and up to date and well promoted. And this should so, sort of um, set out the purpose of the internet provision, the roles and responsibilities, for whom it is intended, any limits on use and consequences of misuse, um, any assistance and guidance available, um, procedures for managing complaints, and its relationship to legal compliance. We had a, 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 a long debate uh, with regard to charges for use because we had initially drafted the guidelines stipulating that um, internet provision should be free of charge at the point of, of use because we saw this as key to ensuring access for all socio-economic groups but during the consultation, we had quite a lot of feedback from people who said that without charges, the provision wouldn't be possible at all. So we've kind of said, well, you know, if, if it's absolutely necessary, then those any charges should be in line with local income levels so that it is affordable for the population that it is intended to serve. But the ideal is um, free of charge at the point of use. And we've also advocated for transparency about any restrictions to use and any use of personal data as a result of the service. And another key debate was around filtering software because the Metal Project found that pretty much every library public library service in the UK was um, impl implements filtering software. And we came to the conclusion that, that, yes, there is a need to maintain a safe environment for vulnerable users. And this may, in some instances, require blocking of specific content. But what we're saying is that this should always aim to be as unrestrictive as possible within the norms of local standards, legislation and um, provisions of parent bodies. Because we recognise that filtering software is an inaccurate and imperfect tool that can lead to underblocking and overblocking and shouldn't be relied on as a single solution. Where it is in place, there should be clear guidelines and a transparent process for unblocking of any legal content that has been blocked inappropriately. And this implies the need for staff training in use of the software and giving staff the authority to unblock sites. Um, we also looked at the issue of Wi-Fi and um, we, we have suggested that the same principles with regard to unhindered access should apply to Wi-Fi provision as to static access. Um, we, we also um, include a, a statement about um, the importance of respecting privacy of use um, for, so that, for instance, you know, if possible, providing guest access without identifiable ID, because sometimes people want to research sensitive topics. Um, we suggest that, you know, the use of privacy screens can help here. 
and that surveillance and monitoring should be kept to the minimum necessary to ensure effective management of the service and legal compliance. And where surveillance is in place, users should be made aware of that. We also believe that um, uh, any public internet provision should be accessible to all in the user community. And that this implies assuming that users have a wide range of differing abilities and therefore the provision of things like assistive technologies, ensuring accessibility features and accessible content um, and, and so on is, is really important. And while the importance of safeguarding of minors is recognised, it uh, shouldn't be used as a justification for excessive levels of filtering. Parental and, and staff training and user education have an equally important role to play here in helping minors learn to evaluate information and to use the internet safely and avoid harm. We recognise that librarians play a key role in enabling users to get optimum benefit from information on the internet. So subject to the mandate and resources of the library, user education should be ongoing for all users and in particular sessions targeted specifically at parents and other caregivers held on a regular basis. Librarians can also help with basic computer skills um, and this is the added value of access in libraries as opposed to internet cafes or other sort of Wi-Fi hotspots. We also suggest that staff interacting with users should be trained regularly, not just on the sort of technical aspects of using the internet, but understanding the basic legal, ethical, societal and political implications of internet use and restrictions to use. Um, to understand the usage policy and any restrictions and also on how to provide education sessions for users. We're suggesting that the more senior personnel should be trained to gain advocacy skills and deeper understanding of, of the policy issues and specific legislation um, relating to privacy, intellectual freedom, intellectual property rights and so on. Social media content should be treated the same as other content on the internet and the principle of full access allowed as much as possible within the limitations of the law. We believe that parents and guardians should take primary responsibility for the social media use of their children. And Tasha in, in 2012 recognised in a report that um, social media use in libraries creates opportunities for um, citizens to participate in networked media production and grassroots economic mobilisation. So it, 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 if we are overly restrictive with regard to social media, we can do more damage than good. And the last two points that the um, guidelines address um, are with regard to decision making and review and stakeholder um, engagement. Again, we recognise that decisions in this area are necessarily sensitive and context dependent and local considerations and community norms will play a part in determining what will work best in a specific context. So we suggest that all library staff and not just as is often the case, IT personnel or administrators, all, all library staff have a role in shaping the culture of information access within the library and should participate in decision making. And libraries need to have a, a schedule of regular review of the effectiveness and relevance of, and need for any restrictions on access and monitoring of use. Community norms and standards are subject to change over time and decisions on access should be held up to regular scrutiny and indeed one of the things that we're hoping to do this morning is to review the continuing re relevance of the guidelines. Um, they should engage and consult with relevant local national stakeholders um, you know as well as end users in reaching those decisions. And finally um, just to say that at the end you know of the um, sort of up um, after John and Kirsty have spoken, we would well, very much welcome your feedback um, in terms of 
how useful you find and relevant you find these guidelines, whether you've been able to use them in practice, any success stories or lessons learned that you would like to share, any changes that you think should be made to them, and your views on whether they are still relevant in the strange times that we are currently experiencing, or perhaps they are more important um, in these current times. So thank you very much for listening. Um, if anybody wants to follow up directly with me, I'm happy to be contacted. And I've also put there the, the link to the guidelines. Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. And indeed, we would be happy to hear more from our participants about their own experiences with setting up and managing public access in libraries. And to start diving into the question of how these principles are reflected in practices in different libraries, different parts of the world, I would like to welcome our second speaker, John Dolan. John, thank you so much for joining us today. I would like to start the discussion by asking if you could perhaps tell us a bit about your work with the Maple Research Project, which Louise mentioned. What were some of the key insights on library public access management practices in the UK that you got through this project? Uh, yeah, thank you, Valencia, and good morning, uh, everybody, from uh, a sunny Birmingham in the UK. Um, yes, I'll, I'll, the guidelines, if you like, go right through everything I'm going to say. So uh, hopefully I will come to a particular slide about the guidelines on the UK. Um, well, just a little bit of introduction. I hope people are here from lots of different parts of our planet. So um, a little bit of background. The UK is, as you may know, a fairly wealthy nation, a little disorientated at the moment, but still suffers nonetheless from significant levels of print literacy uh, with 7% or more uh, adults who have um, very poor literacy. There is a correlation uh, because of other factors like poverty uh, between poor uh, literacy and lower life expectancy. There is a falling but, signif uh, falling but significant number with zero based digital skills. And home internet access is lowest among poorer communities and older adults. In the past 20 years, library provision has been transformed. In 2000, the People's Network Programme put internet access in all public libraries with a national staff training programme and a programme of content creation. Remember this was 2000, so it was very early days um, in terms of ICT provision in public libraries. Today, the functions have widened hugely to deliver all the services, resources and operations a modern library can provide. On the downside, there is no longer a national delivery strategy, um, like the People's Network at the beginning. Um, and provision and services are not consistent across the UK, albeit with lots of coordination and collaboration by national uh, organisations and, and lead bodies. Research is ongoing at the British Library into a single national platform for access to public library uh, web-based services. This is still some time away. If it happens, it will be hugely advantageous uh, for the entire population of users and indeed future users, uh, a consistent offer online of online content and in raising awareness in the public mind and through advocacy to stakeholders, notably government. In the early days, uh, librarians, local authorities, government funders and partners took a fairly liberal view of free, largely unhindered public access to the internet with some of the drawbacks that Louise has outlined, like librarians perhaps not always having control over filtering choices and so on. Nonetheless, there was a widely held feeling that this was a, a new era and a time to open up information uh, through public libraries. But since then, the world has changed and the wider concerns of society are reflected in the management and delivery of internet access and services. Again, here in the UK, each local authority deals with this in its own way albeit with some consistency, again, due to the persuasion of national library agencies and uh, use by government in particular in the last five or so years of public library internet access being uh, used to grow the digital first or digital by default strategy of government departments. So we have a wide range of services and functions delivered by public libraries beyond the simple transactional offer of access to a computer. They take the form of support, learning opportunities, often in partnership with other agencies like the Education Service or the Lifelong Learning Adult Education Service. 
access to public services, often for for poorer people like welfare benefits, as well as the digital version of conventional library services like e-books, e-reference works, and so on. In addition, people are, of course, using public libraries for their own, uh, independently, if you like, for study and work. And when they don't need a library computer, they're using Wi-Fi, um, if you like, the surrogate for the computer. Uh, now, but only recently, is uh, this is in every, every library in the UK. Uh, I spoke with, before today, spoke with Nick Poole, who's the chief exec of SILIT, the UK Library and Information Association, um, to share examples of how he'd used the guidelines or drawn on the guidelines. Um, and two in particular were of interest to me. Significantly, he used it with local authority, one in particular, um, to advocate against charging for internet access. They were reviewing their budgets and they were looking at ways of uh, reducing costs and increasing income. And they were going to introduce charges for internet access, which as I said, hitherto was free. Um, fortunately, uh, his, his, his approach was successful. Um, and interestingly also told me about the national government, how the national government hesitated to close libraries in the pandemic recently, as it would withdraw internet access from those who don't have internet access and or need support in reaching public welfare, help and information. Um, and that level of awareness at, 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 at government um, level, um, I thought was, was, was encouraging really, uh, that they saw uh, libraries as, as relevant in a, in a time of crisis. Several features of the guidelines uh, reflect policy in UK provision, but there are some shortcomings. Um, and I've listed them here, I won't talk through them, uh, but Louise has illustrated, if you like, the kinds of things that, um, that, that we uh, saw as important um, when, when Maple research was undertaken and um, the things that have continued. On one side, you've got the things that, um, the elements that are, are prevail, if you like, uh, but on the other side, some of the shortcomings in, in terms of present provision. I'm particularly ruffled by the fact that some library authorities restrict staff from freely using social media. Um, and this is moderated by people who are not in the library service. That's not everywhere. There are many examples of library authorities who make the most of it. Um, have a look at Orkney, which is uh, renowned for its fun and interesting uh, tweets. Um, they make the most of it and have a lot of fun with creative learning activity, uh, sharing knowledge and information. And this came to the fore in lockdown when libraries only could, could work online and did lots of things in terms of creative um, and, and learning activity. Moving across to, um, to um, low-income countries, I've worked in several low-income countries on national policy and strategy, library spaces and service design. And this always included uh, the now inseparable uh, ITT strategy and approach. i share some common themes I observed. Many have large populations with a sometimes growing rich-poor divide. There is a well-advanced uh, move from an agri well, agricultural to an industrial and latterly to a digital economy. Um, there are large movements of people from rural regions to cities for economic reasons. Uh, we saw the reverse of this in places like India where, where people were returning to their villages during the pandemic. Um, but those people had come to the cities for work. Um, another uh, reason is climate change, where damage to the territory is causing people to move away. Well, sometimes, of course, they're driven by political motive and large numbers move from one place to another. These combine to create a huge need for internet access and online services for communications, information, learning, citizenship, and enterprise. In my experience in uh, low-income countries, there is, at a strategic level, great awareness of an investment in infrastructure. But at a high level, at government level, there are aspirations to, to be at the forefront of digital development in the digital age. There's a lot of technological expertise at academic, at university level, at industrial level, or commercial uh, bodies, if you like, commercial enterprises. But well, there seems to be limited investment in the service delivery end. Public libraries enjoy as places that general popularity 
uh, as an identifier of the community place. So there is a thing about libraries all over the world that people like their library. Uh, but that's the building, the place, the resources on site. Policymakers are ambitious for spreading skills in all sections of the community, with a focus on education, literacy, especially for economic purposes and ambitions. There is a clear understanding of digital skills as the skills of the future, but also that that future is here and now. So these are some common drivers. Uh, I won't read through all of them, but they they, uh, they 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 common drivers between what motivates the development of, of digital activity services to large populations, wide public services here across low-income countries, and reflecting uh, the aspirations of what we've talked about today, the guidelines, um, and some of the Western countries that um, have invested more in that kind of service. As a UK citizen um, and a librarian, um, I would offer a word of caution by recommending policies and approaches that reflect my own Western liberal values. Dynamic change I've mentioned is ongoing and impacts in some significant ways on all low-income countries. But attitudes to democracy, to freedom, will vary as will perceptions of human rights and the right to free expression. Religion and faith in East and West will inform politics and policy making in ways that differ across the world. The relationship between the state and the individual differs from culture to culture. There's a huge tussle going on among the biggest economies for international influence. The winners will determine what is and isn't a right to information access and free expression. This will mean that what is now may not be then, and what the IFLA guidelines require may not be equally valued everywhere. And that is why I think they need to be guidelines for policy and advocacy, and not just a professional resource and a professional luxury. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, John. These are great insights. And indeed, it's very interesting to look at both the commonalities and differences across regions and countries and libraries across the world. And I think our third speaker, Kirsty Crawford, could offer us more insights uh, and a different in-depth look from yet another country, from Bangladesh. Kirsty is a program director of the Libraries Unlimited British Council program. Good morning, Kirsty, and thank you so much for joining us today. So just to start the conversation, could you please tell us a bit about the role that public access plays in the Libraries Unlimited program? Thanks, Valencia. So libraries, um and internet access are playing quite a large role in our project at the moment. Um, I've been based in Dhaka since 2017. Um, I've been working on one of the last Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation Global Libraries funded projects. So, um, yeah, public access is vital we believe in in Bangladesh. I'm going to just give you a bit of background to the project then I'm going to explain the current situation in Bangladesh libraries and with internet provision and then um, how the project plans to address that and the lessons we've learned through that that kind of process. So Libraries Unlimited um, was born in 2016 um, as a result of a report that was published by the Institute of Informatics and Development in Dhaka. Um, it was commissioned by the British Council, BRAC, the Government of Bangladesh and the Bengal Foundation. It discovered that the libraries in Bangladesh in 2015 were in a sorry state. Only 2% of people used libraries for any kind of information. 44% of them didn't have toilets. Um, all the 56% that did have toilets, 41% of those were unusable. 44% um, of the libraries had computers, um, but whether they worked or not was no answered in the survey. So um, we decided with an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding with the Department of Public Libraries, 
which is a division of the Ministry of Cultural Affairs in the Bangladesh government. We signed an MOU with them to develop the public library service. On to Bangladesh itself, it's a country, if you don't know already, of 164 million people. According to um, We Are Social and um, Hootsuite, there are 66.44 million internet users. So that's around 41% of the population. Um, but if you go to rural areas, 72% of that population have low access to the internet and very low digital skills. So um, it's been a bit of a struggle um, for Bangladesh. They have digital ambitions. Um, Vision 2021 is a charter which was aimed to establish a resourceful, technology dependent, modern country through effective use of ICT. But if we look at the literacy rates, which are, are not even 75% in general literacy and the 66.4 million users, there's still some way to go and it is almost 2021. Um, there's other issues in Bangladesh. A lot of uh, a lot of websites are blocked. The you can't use social media in the libraries that do have computers. And there's the introduction of the Digital Security Act in 2018, which is repressive. And it was um, although the restrictive act it replaced, it's, it's not improved matters for the general public and Amnesty International called it a law which is repressive and criminalises freedom of expression. So digital access freedom of expression is um, something that libraries are very concerned with. I'm concerned with in my role in the Faith Committee and we want to address that. So, libraries in Bangladesh, there's only 70 government public libraries. That's one library for 2.3 million people. Um, there's six divisional headquarter libraries, which are nice three-storey buildings like this one. But um, the majority of the libraries are single storeys with a single reading room. Um, facilities depend on the librarians and their contacts and their motivations and their passion, you know, their passion for it. Um, only six had working computers for public use. They're often in a state of disrepair. The librarians may be trained professionals, but they're still keeping new books away from people in anticipation of loss or damage. And, and some of them certainly were before we gave them basic ICT training. Some librarians had not even turned on a computer. So um, getting them up to speed in terms of ICT has been a central plank of the project. Um, so as a result of the lack of internet, um, being, a, being available in Bangladesh public libraries because we believe it is, as, as Louise said, a human right. Um, and in order to help the government achieve their vision 2021, the project decided to invest in putting hardware in the libraries to get all 64 districts of Bangladesh having free public high-speed internet in the public libraries. So, um, yeah, it's been, it's been an interesting, interesting journey. So the EFLA guidelines we have used, um, but I think that, and certainly in the central and the strategic part of the project has been to draft a national public library policy. We've developed this with academics and over a thousand stakeholders over the course of around, a, uh, around 12 months. Um, so it's been a really collaborative project and one of the central parts and policy statements in that 
is that there should be internet and computers available in the public libraries. It re refers to the, the IFLA guidelines and not only that the libraries will have internet provision and will have that in accordance with the guidelines free at the point of use, but also includes the provision for librarians being trained and being able to train uh, members of the public who come in to use the libraries who need help getting online with internet safety and with um, being digitally literate. So that's been a huge strategic part of the project and we're really glad that the, the EFLA guidelines are actually named in the public library policy um, that gives the libraries an international framework and it also helps um, it also helps with the, the development of the public, public libraries and putting the Wi-Fi in will also help not only bridge the digital divide, it helps the project because we've been trying to do coding classes in libraries and we've got 26 code clubs now but it's they're run by volunteers using Wi-Fi dongles at the moment and the librarians as well were working with speeds of oh, one megabit per second so so it's kind of helping everybody and despite COVID having stopped the the installation of the Wi-Fi, we've learned a few lessons already in terms of giving public access to the internet. So the main one being the working with the government, you have to use government suppliers. So commercial suppliers could be cheaper and easier to deal with, but um, with, there's uh, some bureaucracy in the Bangladesh government. So having to coordinate between the Bangladesh telecommunications regulator regulatory authority between the Department of Public Libraries, between the manufacturers and suppliers of the equipment. Um, getting a working group together at the very start is, is vital, I would say, and very important. Um, what else? The costs. So obviously the installation costs are being borne by the project, but we have to make sure there is provision in the budget for the libraries going forward because licenses re need renewed, things break, there needs to be a budget and that took quite some time to get, you know, there's no point investing all this money if it's all going to break down in 12 months time and nobody's going to fix it. So making sure that budget provision is important. Um, in terms of security, the the safe internet that we use and the very secure internet that we use in the British Council um, that was proposed for the Department of Public Libraries and for this solution was just too expensive for the government to bear. So we've had to make compromises on that. Um, but given the surveillance by the Bangladesh government, um, people are highly unlikely to be able to get to anything uh, that, that's not a good idea anyway. Um, staff training, as I said, some librarians didn't know how to turn on the computer. So not only is there the is there the fact that they need to be able to troubleshoot internet issues, to learn how to unblock websites, and and the technical aspects of that. There's also the information literacy and training of trainers, so that they are able to help their users who haven't been online before who aren't aware of digital literacy, who don't know about online safety, who, you know, understand not to put your username in and tick the box saying remember me and, and just that because obviously digital literacy in a country where you can be thrown in jail for sharing a Facebook post is it's important that people understand understand what that is. So they the guidelines are adapted to Bangladesh, they're local context, um, certainly with regards to, to some, of the, some of the policies that will be put in place by the public libraries, but we're using them, the 
government will be using them for the public libraries and they are in the national public library policy which I think um, is just a, a great success for the project and for the guidelines and that's all I have thank you thank you so much Kirsty and we're really looking forward to hearing more about the work of libraries and limited once you're able to continue and this actually brings us to the more open part of the discussion so hearing about the various experiences of libraries in different countries that do nonetheless share some commonalities. We've already began looking at some of the possible challenges and pitfalls in providing public access. Louise, this is something that was obviously examined at length when preparing the IFLA guidelines. So could I perhaps ask you, what would you say the most common challenges are and what kind of recommendations would you give in tackling them? Um, yes, as we've seen from the other presentations as well, you know, the challenges are multiple, you know, ranging from obviously the, um, issues of infrastructure and cost and so on. But I think the, the challenge that um, I specifically had wanted to grapple with was this difficult one of balancing the um, sort of professional ethics ethic with regard to freedom of expression and freedom of access to information and at the same time you know librarians concern about um, you know particularly librarians on the, on the um, sort of shop floor as it were who are the ones who are confronted with you know people who maybe want to access things that are, are not suitable for the library they uh, um, have to deal with complaints from the community and so on and it was you know I think I think that is in some ways a, a harder challenge the other things can be addressed in terms of you know with time and money um, I mean I wouldn't want to underestimate the challenges involved but I think it is this issue of you know how do you um, balance um, the the libraries um, importance as a provider of information and you know the our natural sort of disinclination to censor um, with the sort of pressures coming from outside um, that you know I mean that there was a case uh, going back a long way now um, in Canada where you know sort of there, there had been some local media that had uh, cottoned on to the fact that people had accessed pornography in the library and it all blew up into a big public relations sort of fiasco, um, you know, with, uh, and suggesting that the public libraries were full of pornography and so on. And it is actually, how do you manage that? And that's been exacerbated with, obviously, with the advent of social media, user-generated content, um, uh, which, you know, I'd hasten to add, offer huge opportunities, um, but also lessen the sort of control over information. Sorry, I've, I've probably gone on a bit too long there, so I'll let somebody else speak. Thank you so much, Louise. These are great insights. And I was actually wondering, John, comparing your experiences with libraries in different national contexts, would you see that reflected in your experiences as well? Is there something you would add to this? Are there key challenges or opportunities? We, I think we've all touched on this, so uh, I'll, I'll try not to repeat things. I think the, the other thing for libraries, if, if, if we want to talk about libraries per se, is the what we found in the UK is the transformational impact of introducing this. Um, and if, if stakeholders, governments, local authorities and others can see that that their investment pays off then there's there's re great rewards to be had um it transforms the the demographic of the public library user community bringing uh people who who might not have used the library before they're not fiction readers or they didn't need non-fiction which of course is, is there's a lot less of now in libraries uh because of um online resources and and google and the internet and so on um, but it nonetheless brings in uh, a whole raft of people who didn't use libraries before um, so it's widening the market for library provision in the way that any organization uh, wants to create products that meet uh, the the needs and interests and aspirations of the widest community and that makes it very exciting and that's why I emphasized 
the need to uh, to think ahead beyond the provision of the computer. You know, Kirsty talked about um, coding clubs and so on. Uh, making libraries digital centres, places. That's what they are. They were print centres, now they're print and digital centres. Uh, they're there for communications and learning and creativity. Um, much as they were in the 19th century, but it's not about necessarily now gathering and protecting books, especially new books, Kirsty. But it is about dissemination, distributing, connecting people um, and giving people opportunities. Um, and that's why sometimes the powers that be are afraid of them. Yeah. They are centres that, that facilitate the use of, of the internet. It was interesting that the British government's response in COVID was to be reluctant to close libraries because it would stop people accessing the uh, online process for applying for universal credit, a hugely complicated process to get welfare benefits. It takes about an hour and a half to fill in the form online. If you don't have the skills or experience, that's doubly difficult. So that sort of use is fine. What government needs to do is realise that all the other uses that we call democratic or creative um, are also of value. And people respond to that kind of role uh, when the library stands up and provides it. Thank you so much, John. Um, and as we were speaking, in fact, we did get a comment from uh, John in the chat outlining her experiences with public internet access in libraries in New Zealand. Joan uh, highlighted that to be a part of the Aotearoa People's Network Kaharoa, libraries must offer access to the internet for free, although they may charge for printing. Um, she notes that accessing social media sites is a major use of the network and that the content of social media is not filtered the way websites are. And this in turn could pose challenges because of violent or otherwise inappropriate content and that some staff find it difficult to advise customers that this may not be appropriate for public environments. She notes that during COVID, the network had to be turned off to discourage movement as libraries themselves were closed. Um, but in most natural disasters, the network had been seen as an asset to help ensure communication for the public. The New Zealand government has provided additional funds to help more libraries offer internet for free, as well as to help improve digital literacy. Thank you very much for your insights, Joanne. And uh, indeed, there's, these are unique challenges when it comes to public access provision and public needs in terms of digital inclusion during COVID and during this pandemic. And obviously, Kirsty, as you have mentioned, for the Libraries and Limited project, the pandemic had an impact on the plans and the work that was uh, carried out. So I was wondering if I could ask, when you're going to resume the work on this project, uh, are there any insights or lessons learned during the pandemic that you might take note of or adopt going forward as you tackle this work? How can libraries continue to adapt their efforts to help more people get online in these new circumstances, in your opinion? Thanks, Valencia. Um, yeah, at the moment, um, we literally are just going to put the internet into libraries. We have supplied over 100 computers to the public libraries as well, and that's not enough. Um, we are supplying Cano computers. I d if you're aware, they are a version of a Raspberry Pi, so you have to build them first. They have very small screens, separate screens, separate keyboard. Um, but we are donating around eight of those to each of the public libraries as well. So we're giving them computer access. Um, that does not have your Windows suites on it, but it has free equivalents for email, for Word, for Excel, etc. It has free equivalents. And uh, given the licensing situation in Bangladesh, that's, that's not a huge issue anyway. People don't tend to email or use the licensed versions of, of software. What I would like to do, there's not a great deal of time left on the project, is to try and get the internet to people as well. So try and find um, one of the telecoms providers perhaps. We use, as I said, the Wi-Fi dongles for the coding clubs at the moment. 
is to try and get donations of those that the libraries can lend so that people can take a hotspot home, for instance, because we're very aware that, you know, that a mobile phone penetration is huge, but there's no very little 4G and not enough, more than 50% of mobile phone usage, I'll need to check the stats, but they're not even 2G, they're just basic phones. There's no very few smartphones and very little connectivity anyway. So yeah, finding some way and whether that's dongles, hotspots, just getting the internet out, out to people's houses and, and not just available in the libraries is something that we, we're gonna try and do. But as I say, I'm, I'm not hugely confident given the time we have left. Thank you for these insights, Kirsty. And we're very much looking forward to seeing what work can be done in these last months of the project. I think we're reaching the top of the hour and for the last few minutes what I want to do is give the floor to each of our speakers for any concluding remarks. Louise, what would be the biggest takeaways for you from the discussion today? Well, it would really just be to say that, um, you know, the, the guidelines as they exist now will not necessarily be relevant for the next sort of five, ten years. Um, they should be a dynamic thing and they should be regularly reviewed. And I would certainly want to um, involve as many people as I can in that process and get as much feedback. So, you know, anyone who's, um, we've not had much time for sort of audience questions this morning, which, which is a bit of a shame, but um, anyone who's been watching and has comments to offer, I, um, I, I would very much welcome their feedback um, to me. Thank you, Louise. Um, and John, what would be the key conclusion that you can draw after the discussion today? I would want to say let's not fall for the, uh, the error, I would say, of getting preoccupied with abuse and misuse. There are things to be handled, but the level is minuscule. It's immeasurably small. Uh, what really matters is the guidelines become a proactive tool, a tool for IFLA and library associations and librarians around the world to promote the importance of internet access in libraries, to make libraries come if they're not there already, like Kirsty's described, uh, but get on with being in the 21st century. I mean, we're, we're a third of the way through it now. We can't, we've got to stop saying, let's get into the 21st century because we're <laughs> half. Um, let, let's let's use guidelines as 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 a as a as a tool for proactivity and if uh, you know and this this kind of conversation be happening outside the library community yeah. um, in places like the United Nations where you mentioned sustainable development goals these are uh, the the libraries uh, around the world are a, a fantastic tool the minute you show a donkey with with books on its back everybody thinks it's wonderful and the libraries are marvelous you mentioned the internet they get upset about some idiot some way using it wrongly um let's get in there with what the millions of libraries around the world and all those wonderful librarians can really do to help society and to help community thank you very much john um and kirsty what would be the biggest takeaway messages for you um for me and for the project it's going to be about advocacy we need to tell people that the internet is <coughs> available we need to tell them that it's free we need to um, advocate for freedom of expression as, as well, but um, essentially it's, it's going to be the, the marketing, the advocacy, um, telling people that, that the internet is, is now there and is now free and we will help you to use it. Thank you so much, Kirsty. And I think this concludes the webinar for today. Um, however, as Louise mentioned, we are keen to keep the discussion going. So after the end of the webinar, we will be posting the recording and the contact information of the speakers on the event page of the IFA website. And you are always welcome to reach out and to continue discussing your experiences and lessons learned from your own work with public access. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you once again to our wonderful speakers. And I hope this has been a useful conversation to have in 2020 when digital inclusion was once again shown to be ever so important. And I look forward to continuing the discussion after the webinar.
Thank you very much and have a good rest of the day. Thank you, Valencia. And thank, thank you, everybody you. else thank for you. coming.